Hi everybody, it's uh, Monday, it's, uh, okay, it's 1.09, I had some uh, internet problems, but it is time for um, Pirkei Avot History and Ashkafa, uh, sponsored by the Tel Aviv in uh, International Synagogue under the inspired leadership of Rabbi Ariel Constantine. Um, we were in the midst of a um, Mishnah that is going to take us a few weeks because every single line, every single line is uh, totally... Um, is totally uh, pregnant with uh, with meaning and with the information. Please excuse me. I have to um, shut off the uh, phone. Um, the Mishnah that we're talking about is the third chapter, uh, Mishnah eleven, where Belazar Modai, who we discussed, was a um, came from the town of Modian, which is located in Modian, more or less. Uh, let me said that we fix that. And um, he uh, lived at the time of the um, of the um, rebellion of Bar Kokhba, uh, and he put together a series of um, behaviors and a series of attitudes that he found particularly pernicious and particularly dangerous. And what's striking is the way that in every generation, different uh, interpreters ha saw felt that these words resonated. In, in totally different ways, but we're nevertheless, nevertheless relevant. So last week we speak, we spoke about Hamachalel Lekodeshim, and this week we're going to talk about the next uh, strophe, which is Hamevaze et Hamoadot, a person who despises, a person who makes light of, a person who um, is disrespectful of uh, Moadot of the holidays. The question is, of what are we, what are we talking about here? What, are, what, what? Could this possibly re to what could this possibly refer? Um, and as I said, there are different um, there are different approaches among the commentators. Each one reflecting their what's there's the fancy German word uh, their Zitzimleben their immediate uh, their immediate background. So uh, historically speaking, in terms of what was bothering Rabbi Lazar Modai, uh, there were a number of uh, we really will never know because it's not uh, it's not 100 percent clear, but. Um, he may here be referring to um, people who are making fun of or not taking seriously the restrictions that Chazal added uh, or perceived to exist during Cholomoed. Um, uh, Cholomoed is that funny kind of um, intermediate period between on Sukkot and Pesach when you have real full holidays at each end. And in the middle, it's Chol and it's Moed. It's 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 a day. It, you're allowed to do certain types of malachot. You, it's, a, it's a day. It's it's a quotidian period of time on the one hand, and then it's still Yontif. So how does that play itself out? A famous example is the debate about whether we whether men should put on tefillin uh, during Chol Moed. Is it Yontif? Is it not Yontif? Um, the um, and and the and the truth of the matter is that's an almost an irre irresolvable. Um, irresolvable um, um, argument. Interestingly, my impression is, and I may be wrong, and it may very well be the difference between living in a uh, Jewish state and living abroad, uh, my impression has always been that, uh, largely speaking, uh, in Chutzlar, it's outside the land of Israel, um, this intermediate period is more chol, it's more weekday than Yom Tif, even though you know, people don't eat chametz and they eat matzah during Pesach and they sit in the sukkah, but still comes out to be more uh, chol than uh, moed. And, and and because in Israel we get off that week, there's no schools and so on, it's more yantif than, uh, than chol. But either way, that seems to be the uh, the historical background. But what's striking is what happens later. This is really it's amazing. Um... And indeed, uh, and upon second thought, it may very well be that this might be his original intention as well. But one of the major points of argument, of dispute, between the Karaites and the Rabbinites actually relates to this, to this phrase, to the question of the holidays. Let me, let me back up a little bit. Um, According to the um, way that the oral law understands the Torah, um, the proper way of determining the holidays, the per determining Rosh Chodesh, determining how the months uh, are to be set, how the calendar is to be set, 
um, is that two witnesses should um, should be on the lookout for uh, the new moon, for the first sliver of the new moon, and then they come running to the uh, court in Jerusalem or wherever the uh, wherever the authorized court exists. Sometimes it's even a chutzlar. And testify that they saw the new moon, and then the Beit Din declares Mekudash, Mekudash, the um, the uh, the moon. It's, it's it's today's the new moon, and when whatever happens, if it, if they, if it's Tishrei, then you know today is Rosh Hashanah. Uh, if it's uh, Pesach, Pesach will be in two weeks. Whatever the or in our case, uh, last week was Rosh Chodesh Tammuz, so Shabbat Shabbat Tammuz will be uh, next uh, Shabbos, even though we'll, uh, we'll we'll mark it on Sunday. Whatever the case might be, so it's it's based it's it's primarily based on witnesses. And um, with, within a, and the rabbis, according to the way that the Talmud has it, I have a certain amount of wiggle room in terms of maneuvering, in terms of when they, when they can ignore the witnesses or not. So, for example, um, generally, it's not supposed to happen, happened this year. Uh, in a Shemitah year, in a sabbatical year, you're not supposed to really add an extra month. Now, why do you add an extra month? Why would you think to do that? Because the Torah does give certain guidelines as to how the year should look as a whole. Um, and that requires my going backwards even. Let's, I, sh- I, should have, I should have reorganized the way I'm doing this. All right, let's do it this way. The Jewish year, the Jewish year is primarily lunar. The uh, fundamental unit, the basic unit of the Jewish year is a lunar month, which has 29 and a half days. That doesn't change. But there's no such thing as a half a day. So therefore, if you have a month, uh, if a year of 12 months, then every other month will be of 30 days. Of the, every other month will be 30 days, and one month will be 29 days. Um, now, that's point number one. Point number two is that a, um, the solar year is 365 and quarter days, and the lunar year is 354 days. In other words, there's a net loss, a net gap of 11 days between the lunar year and the solar year. Now, since the solar year uh, or the seasons of the year are dependent upon the solar cycle, uh, that means that uh, if you just follow a solar, a lunar calendar, there will be an 11 day regression backwards. In other words, the, the next year will start 11 days earlier in terms of the solar year, and um, with the result that holidays will go into a cycle of reverse and could actually occur during every season of the year. Over, the, over time. And that is precisely what happens in the Muslim calendar. The Muslim calendar is totally is totally lunar, and therefore Ramadan can actually occur any time of the year. Um, the Muslims are better off when Ramadan happens. It occurs in December because the days are shorter, because they fast less, and if when they are in uh, August, then uh, it's very difficult. Um, the Torah, however, says Shamor et Chodesh Ha'aviv um, that Pesach should fall in the spring, in the time when the wheat, when the uh, when the wheat first um, begins to uh, be ready for um, for harvesting. The rabbis understood this to mean that you always have to make sure that the solar and the lunar calendars are aligned so that the holidays always fall in their appointed seasons. Uh, in order to do that, to prevent this regression of 11, 11 days every single month, every single year, so every so often, um, every number of years, a, a month a month of 30 days is added at the end of the 12 months, Adar, before Nisan. Nisan is always the first month, uh, and um, as we have this year. So um, that's, number, uh, that's number one. Number two... Uh, the rabbis have the capacity, or they have, a, they have the authorization, according to the Talmud, to decide when those years will be, when you add the, when you add the extra month. Uh, one of the things the rabbis try very hard not to do was to make sure that they, was to, was to, they make sure not to add a month during the sabbatical year, because it's, it's a tremendous economic hardship to um, work the, uh, not to work the land an extra month. Uh, as it is, not working the land for, for, a month, for a year is hard enough. Adding, adding, to the, adding to the difficulty is not something we try to, get, we try to do. Uh, as it happens this year, um, is, if there is a, if we do have what's called a, a sabbatical year. It's a Shemitah year, and it's also a leap year when you have two Adars. And why that happened is a long uh, story, which I can't go into right now. Okay, anyways, that's the way it's supposed to work. In the 4th century CE, um, the, um, the um, Roman government, which had already become Christian, 
decided that they want, for reasons which I, I can't go into right now, decided that they were going to try to prevent the Jews from, in fact, uh, following this system of um, calculation of the, uh, or determination of the calendar. Uh, this was um, ma made totally impossible when they abolished the, um, the Sanhedrin in 425. Uh, it's a course of 75 years, basically, the Byzantine government, the Roman Christian government, uh, wreaked havoc with Jewish self-rule. And then the question became, okay, so how are we going to determine the calendar? Yeah, because without the calendar, Judaism collapses. Shabbos doesn't collapse. But aside from that, uh, there's no holidays. How do we sanctify the holidays? Uh, because holidays are not built into the, uh, to the calendar the way Shabbos is. Uh, at that juncture, uh, according to tradition, the um, uh, head of the Pharisees, or the last, one of the last heads of the Sanhedrin, whose name was Hillel II, uh, published a uh, mathematical formulation, a series of mathematical formula formulas that you could use to approximate the um, to approximate the uh, uh, the uh, to determine the holidays, and it would be in temporary use until such time as the original system could be restored. Now, as in so many things in Israel uh, and in Jewish life in general, there's nothing more permanent than the temporary, and we're still using it because the, because subsequently the uh, the authorization of courts, what's called smicha, the original smicha, or the nation of rabbis, disappeared or is abolished by the Romans, and and uh, so to this day we det we rely upon this uh, upon this. Um, formula to be able to determine uh, the calendar in advance. Um, now, the, um, that being the case, the, um, it meant, uh, that being the case, so witnesses were no longer used and witnesses were no, no, no longer employed. Okay. Where does Hill the Second get off coming up with this uh, with this with this formula? This is a whole this is an entire discussion. Rav Sajagon went so far as to say that um, that uh, that the Torah and Maimonides says this as well that um, when the Torah was given, both systems, both the witness, the system by witness and the system by uh, by by you know, by mathematical calcul calculation were part of the same package. Others say no. This is something that Hill the Second sort of like figured out based on. Um, based on um, past years and past experience in terms of what kind of patterns of calculations were involved. It's not, it's, uh, it, the matter, it's still, a, it's still very much a moot question. In any event, that's what the Jews used. Now, in 755 approximately, uh, as a result of a lot of machinations within the, um, within the uh, heads of the Jewish community in Babylonia, or Baghdad for that matter, there was a schism. A group of Jews, led by a man named Anan, son of David, who actually wanted to be the uh, <laughs> wanted to be the uh, head of the Gola, but he didn't get the job. Anyway, it's not important. Um, start founded a group of um, founded a group called the Karaites. He basically said that um, he denied the legitimacy of the oral law, he denied the authority of the rabbis, and he said, you know, this Talmud is all made up by the rabbis, and we are just going to live according to the Bible. Literally. That's why they're called Kara'im. Kara'ites, meaning we follow the Bible, Mikra, as opposed to the other people who were called Rabbanim, or Rabbanim, Rabbanites. It's a fascinating story, which um, deserves its own... Uh, this serves its own session, and, and hope maybe we will get to it. In any event, um, one of the first things that Anan asserted, and those who joined him asserted, was that the calendar as promulgated by the rabbis was illegitimate. The only way to determine the calendar is through... Um, is through uh, testimony by witnesses. They denied the fact that there was any such thing as a traditional smicha or form of rabbinic authorization. They said, we are as authorized, we are as competent as anybody else in the, past, in the history of the Jewish people, and therefore they set up their own calendar. And they, and they basically determined the calendar, again, based on witnesses, the same way that it had been done, more or less, 
up until the abol abolition of the Patriarchate, uh, the Sanhedrin, in 425 CE. The result of this was that two, that, that the Jewish people split into two, and at one time almost 40%, maybe 50% of the Jewish people were Karaites. That was a tremendous rebellion. It was a very, very big danger for rabbinic Judaism. Um, and um, they started keeping separate, separate calendars. They did not celebrate any of the holidays together, except for Shabbat. And the Rabbinites, the rabbis who lived at the time of the Karaite schism, um, saw in the words of Eleazar Amoda, Rabbi Eleazar Amodai an asser assertion of, or, or, or a protest against the Karaites. Hamivaze et hamoadot, meaning anyone who denies the holidays or the sanctity of the holidays or the calendar as set by the rabbis, uh, says the, um, says the, says, he says at the end, uh, has no place in the world to come. This is an, uh, this is, in other words, they should view this as a, an assertion of protest against this split in the Jewish people based on a rejection of what was already uh, had been a system of a calculation made in place for 400 years. Now, one could argue that that's an apologetic statement, or it's a, uh, it's, it's sort of like a, well, how should I put this? Um, it's a, um, it's just sort of like, you know, some people getting angry. But there's more to it than that. It's more to it than that. Why would you say? So you have, so you celebrate the holidays on different occasions. What's the, what's the difference? What's the big deal? So you'll let Pesach over there, and I'll be Pesach over here. We'll live together and be very fine. Um, here, um, in order to understand the, the weighty uh, nature of the, uh, of, of the way that, of, of this understanding of Rebbe Lezer Motovi's statement, you need an insight of uh, a person who was, without a doubt, the greatest Jewish historian of the, not, of two generations ago. Uh, his name was Professor Yaakov Katz. Uh, I guess I'm his, 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 my teacher, one of my teachers, uh, Chaim Soloveitchik, was his uh, Dr. Zun, so I guess I'm his doctor grandson. In any case, he was a person who really created the um, uh, the fields of history of halacha and the fields of um, history of, of the social history of halacha. And Katz had uh, among uh, many many brilliant uh, insights. Uh, made the, once made the on several occasions made the observation that the Jewish people cannot. Um, split into two. In other words, you nobody can break off from the Jewish people uh, terminally, uh, based except for two reasons. There are only two things that lead to to the loss to the Jewish people of a significant population. It's not observance. In other words, if part of the Jewish people is not Shomer Shabbat, if part of the Jewish people doesn't keep kosher, if part of the Jewish people doesn't, I, I know what they do. They don't do anything. That does not stop them from being Jews, and they do not fall off from Jewish people, and they can always come back. There were only, he said, they pointed out there were only two um, uh, factors, there were only two um, positions that can be adopted by Jews that can lead to the loss of significant populations of Jews. One is uh, a person who's not converted, or disagreements about how, how, who is a Jew. In other words, it has always happened that, that, for example, the early Christians stopped being Jewish when they stopped, when the people, if they, when they marry, when they stopped marry, when they stopped marrying only Jews or stopped insisting on conversion uh, to Judaism for, um, for marriage. A or B is a difference of opinion about the calendar. Katz was of the opinion that it was the calendar, it was the, this break in the calendar. This uh, breaking off from the Jewish people through the refusal by the Karaites to celebrate the major events of the Jewish cal of the of the Jewish year, together with Rabbinites, which ultimately paved the way for their leaving the Jewish people permanently. Why is that? That seems rather. I mean, who is a Jew? I understand. I mean, you know, if you're not if you're not halakhically Jewish, then as far as Jewish tradition is concerned, you're not Jewish. You stopped. I mean, you could have biological. 
you know, relations. You could be what's called Misere Israel, and maybe, according to some, that could actually facilitate your reconversion, but you're not Jewish. What's, what is, what is, what's the calendar got to do with me? What the holiday, what do the holidays have to do with it? So Katz made it very, uh, point, put it very, very clearly. He said, look, what is the, what's the function of a calendar? What does a calendar do? A calendar is an organization of time. But it's not just an organization of time. If that's all it was, then we wouldn't need a Jewish calendar. A calendar is also an organization of memory. It's an organization of identity. Depending on which calendar you follow, because the, the events that are embedded in the calendar are those that cultivate and strengthen your, um, uh, your, your, uh, your, your group memories, your personal memories, the, the, the texture of your life, what are you anticipating? I mean, let me give you an example. So, so Motzi Shabbos is, uh, well, Mary Shabbos already, Yeshiva Saber Tammuz. So it's already, the three weeks are already coming. That's, that's not just a calendrical determination. That's an emotional determination. That's a national determination. That's a religious determination that envelops your awareness and which determines the way you look at time. It's not a matter of just organizing time. It's the content in which you instill in, in, with which you instill time. Um, three weeks, uh, then you have three weeks after the, after Tisha B'av, and then it's already Elul. Elul is a Elul is a um, state of mind. The Yom, you're looking forward to the Yom Nuraim, then and, and Sukkot, then that's another state of time. Moving up to, to Hanukkah, whatever the case might be, if you organize yourself around Jewish points of uh, points of, uh, de- of of entree and departure, then that is what colors and uh, fashions. Uh, the way that you uh, calculate the calculus of your life, uh, emotionally, nationally, uh, spiritually, and, and every other way. Uh, a person who shifts to another uh, to another calendar, um, that's an act of this, that's an act of assimilation. I'm not saying that if you use a general calendar that you're assimilating. But if that's how you organize your life, then you are fundamentally organizing yourself around something else. You're organizing yourself. New Year's and Christmas and 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 another another system of values and memories and 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 uh and then the self-identifications in which you can have jewish observances that sort of like poke their way in a little bit but they're not the formative element of one's of one's self-definition so says katz if if just the fact that you refuse to celebrate with everybody else here he's speaking of the karaites says everything about who you are. You're basically saying, I don't want to be part of you anymore. So we'll all, we're all Jews and we'll all do something different. No. Changing the calendar means I don't want to, you know, I, I, what was it? The way that, um, I think it was Yeravim said, uh, when, he set up the, uh, when he set up the golden caps and uh, done and in baked Um so that, so that when, when Rabbi Lazar Modei says, he wasn't just protesting for the authority of the rabbis. I mean, which, you know, or they perceived as being, of doing that. But rather, he was, um, he was actually asserting that if you do not, if you make fun, if you humiliate, if you make light of the holidays of Jewish people, you are making a statement that you don't want to be part of the Jewish people, of its, neither of its past nor of its present, and certainly not of its future. Such a person has no chelik, well, person doesn't have a place in the world to, in, in the world to come in this world, in other words, whatever happens to us, and also what, 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 in the next world, because you're basically saying it's measure for measure. I don't want to be part of this, because not because I don't want the holidays, because of everything that the holidays do in terms of forming Jewish identity, forming Jewish self-definition. Um, now, it may very well be, coming back to that, um, and with this we'll close, that... What I just said about the Karaites may very well um, be the uh, uh, be something similar to what later authorities, saw, later commentaries, saw as relating to the Karaites may very well be, be with that to which um, Rabbi Lazar Modai was responding, because in his day and the generations after, um, in the generations after uh, the destruction. There were still Sadducees around, and there were still Essenes around. And the Essenes, uh, even though they were slowly uh, disappearing, uh, had a whole different calendar than than than, than everybody else. Uh, so he may have been 
referring to the last vestiges of the non-Rabbinite, non-Rabbinic kind of uh, you know, approach to the Talmud. I, I don't know. I'm just, it's a guess on my part. Uh, in any event, in any event, it is a f- what 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 Professor Katz said about the cal- about the function of the calendar. Um, is uh, rem- uh, it, it's true till today. It's uh, quite interesting that um, it was Dafka, the uh, generation of the Palmach, the Chilonim, who were in the Achdut Avoda and uh, and were in the Palmach, who generally politically, were, religiously, were leftists, were very, very, it was very important to them to restore the Jewish calendar. Because how Jews organize time, meaning we have a different dynamic and we live in a different dimension of time, a different historical dimension. There's a famous, um, I used to listen to her whenever she was on, but it was like until the middle of the night. There was a famous, um, oh, I know what to call her, uh, public personality. Um, she did the popular culture. Her name was Nativa Ben Yehuda. Her father was Baruch Ben Yehuda, who was the uh, principal of um, Gymnasia Herzliya in Tel Aviv. And she would often comment on the fact that she had no idea what the her English, what the general date of her birth was. She knew she was born in Tisha B'Av because that was, you know, and the, the generation of founders, even the secularists, knew that we have to restore a Jewish dynamic and a Jewish uh, rhythm to time and to, uh, and to the way we organize the calendar in order to be able to restore uh, a uniquely and a um, specifically Jewish kind of... Uh, kind of rhythm to uh, to life here. Okay, in any event, that is Hamivaze uh, et Hamamadot. We will um, get back to the next uh, the next session is Hamalbin Pene Chavero Barabim. If you humiliate somebody in public, we have to talk about that at length. Now that we're Israel's going to now that Israel's going to uh, elections, there's going to be a lot of that. So there's going to be a lot of what to talk about. In the meantime, um, we will see you uh, next time. Uh, have an easy fast on Sunday. And uh, bye.